very much, um, Valentina, for that for that welcome. Uh, so, uh, what a pleasure it is uh, to see all of you. Uh, and it was uh, it was wonderful to talk to all of you last night, and uh, and I'm really looking forward, as I said, to uh, to spending these next two days with you. Uh, so my job at the moment is to have a little bit of a historical look at the uh, Partners for Rabies Prevention. Um, it's a little bit light and a little bit heavy, uh, both of those. Um, I think, um, uh, you know, it all started in 2008. This is with the, the foundation uh, of uh, Frederico Spinola, uh, and we had good years. Uh, in in Bana, uh, so all those years ago, and many of these slides, uh, I've just taken the original slides. I haven't made any changes to them. So these are the slides that we used in in those previous meetings, uh, and this is one of them. Uh, just to explain what the what PRP was going to be about: the public and private, the global alliance, all of the others, um, with then. Uh, the Global Alliance is the, at the uh, Secretariat. Uh, but immediately, these five pillars were identified, advocacy, communications, uh, research, capacity building, and pilot projects. And pilot projects was the one, the first one that was successful, the, uh, that was the Bill and Melinda Gates projects. And in case you can't see th those people there, I don't recognize most of them. So I, so I, so those are the, uh, are the actual people, but uh, to be truthful, uh, there's only five people on that list who also made it here um, uh, today. I don't want to say only five. I said there is as much as five um, people from that original list who's on here. And when I looked through it, I was interested to see people like Hedion Bruckner. I, um, so I wasn't at the first um, meeting, but this is a slide from that meeting, and I show the slide because I was captivated by the, the by the um, by the theme. It says frustration of the rabies community, and I think at the time this really was uh, people were frustrated. And if you look at some of these points, um, uh, so for example, so the frustration felt by all. Um, you know, what, uh, what can we do? If you look at this last bullet, why is rabies currently not a priority? We need to attract more awareness. We need to secure the link between decision makers. You can read for yourself. So that's, um, so that, that was the, the, the beginning area. This slide, slides also come from that original presentations. Um, so why an informal group? Um, so no single organization can make it alone. Etc. There's a growing momentum for rabies. So this was just after World Rabies Day was created. So and World <clears throat> Rabies Day was so successful in the beginning that you know everybody realized we need to move this along. We need to gain momentum. Um, and the objective, as it is, uh, to provide a platform to bring together skills and capacity uh, to set up advocacy on an international level was. Uh, kind of very important objectives uh, in the beginning. For the next meeting, I made the cut. Um, uh, so I'm, uh, I'm also then, it was an age cut, by the way. At, uh, in those days, you needed to be, you know, a certain advanced age to be able to, um, to be included. But um, uh, that's, we're still in, in Bana, and we, we managed to keep going in Bana for a for a number of years until 2013, when we uh, we then moved to um, Wolfsbach in uh, in Switzerland. And by the way, that this was all courtesy of um, of Kim Doyle of Spana, so he had the connection with the Spinola Foundation, and then of course our projects with UBS, um, which allowed us to secure the venue at um, at Wolfsbach for. Uh, uh, for a number of years, um, some of you would recognize that uh, that area. We actually this where we are now uh, reminds me very much of uh, of Wolfsberg as well. You know, with the the wonderful lake uh, in the background, um, green areas. Um, um, so, 
so I think we were very fortunate to be able to have such havens uh, where we could get together um, for our discussions. And we weren't always outside, we sometimes we were inside as well. Um, uh, until 2018, so we, so, so we were fortunate to be able to use Wolfsbach for, uh, for six years. Um, and then our last meeting was in 2019, many of you will remember. I couldn't find um, the picture that we took on the steps of that building in, in Westminster. Uh, I only could find some, some so, but you'll remember we worked on the Sysot, the Raby Sysot, the, the tools matrix, and that was then the last meeting we had, which was in, in 2019. So, um, so I think going through uh, all of the various minutes and agendas of all these meetings, I can honestly tell you that I, even though I've been involved in the process, it was actually mind-boggling the amount of things that were dealt with in these years uh, in the PRP meetings. And I'm not just talking about talk shops. The things that were discussed in real earnest uh, and things that were being tried, ideas that were being kicked around. And I think it very much shaped um, our thinking as, you know, where, where, where we are today. And, uh, you know, I thought, how can I capture this? And actually, it, it would take a long time to capture, uh, to capture all of that. But that is a list of some of the, of the main things. And they're all obviously still in the public domain. If you go to the Alliance website, um, you information on meetings by the Partners for Rabies Prevention. And if you click there, you go to all of these meetings, you go to all the presentations, the detailed um, agendas, et cetera, and some of the major outputs which have their own websites uh, are also uh, linked there. So it's quite something um, to look at that. Um, so uh, uh, DPM was, uh, was a big talking point. We had that one year, we, we also had Doug Ekri, and there was a very specific focus on, on that. Health economics started early on, uh, and for a number of years, this was important, not just to show the burden, but also to, uh, to measure the impact uh, of, uh, of intervention. You're all familiar with the canine blueprint, which now is, becomes an important tool for the UAR uh, forum, uh, similar with the surveillance blueprint, which, fo which followed after that. Uh, the Global Atlas of Rabies, which is now also an important um, pro uh, product for the United Against Rabies Forum. The burden of dog rabies. Uh, so the, the whole issue of cost, I remember it was in 2010 with uh, uh, Laura de Coutville, I think, where this whole thing started. And we had very intense discussions at the time. And this culminated in, in, in the Katie Hampson um, uh, publication. So over a couple of years, this was always a theme at the PRP and eventually in 2015 published as the, um, uh, as the new study on burden fox rabies. Uh, Thomas, uh, again, uh, played a big role. The uh, landscape analysis, that was the year when we had Bia and Spring Gombe. Um, uh, and, and I remember all of the institutions had to give their own perspective and um, from industry, there was a perspective. From the intergovernmental agencies, there was this perspective. From academia, a perspective. Uh, and all of this is documented. And going through that was quite interesting uh, for me to just to revisit that. And they, these were important exercises that also made us to look inward a little bit, each of us, and look at our perspective. Uh, the case of change, I think the person was Kim Lamer that year who, uh, who uh, worked with WHO and was at that specific meeting to, uh, to help us to prepare for the case of change. And so, if, you know, so that eventually that led us to where we can be with United Against Rabies, um, which ultimately uh, is... Um, is where we are today with the United Against Rabies Forum. 19, uh, 2017 and 18 was very much dedicated to the United Against Rabies Forum with 
Saleh Khan, who helped us from Price Waterhouse Coopers, and he he was uh, he led uh, major portions of those two particular mm -hmm. meetings. Um, so, uh, in in history, it it is a it is a very significant package, and very pleasing to actually see that and and to reflect on how. How, how thinking has changed. It is a slow process, but a very deliberate one, uh, and and one where everybody um, contributed, uh, and the the it's there to see in the product. So if I look at the original objectives, um, and th this was not all of the objectives, but this is the original slide. So I'm just using that. But all of the main things to bring together the major players who didn't work together, to bring them together uh, and to advocate on a higher level uh, for this disease, rabies. I think that was some of the main uh, uh, main objectives of the PRP in the beginning. And I think that's been achieved. I really do think so. And the evidence is um, the United Against Rabies, uh, collaboration, these, the development of the global strategic plan, and where we are now with the United Against Rabies Forum, which can take um, ahead uh, and build on these major um, achievements. But this is my plea uh, for, for United Against Rabies going forward, and for all of us going forward. Mm -hmm. Just before the pandemic, I started to make quite a bit of a study on, and I my question was, there were two viral diseases being eradicated. Smallpox is the one, Rinderpest is the other. How did they do it? So we are making progress, but are we making good enough progress? Well, are there lessons that we can learn that we are actually not learning, that we are not looking at? Uh, and I started to look into this. And if you look at smallpox, and the, these are things that, that we could identify, those eight uh, different steps. Uh, I mean, this was, this was an, a very effective campaign um, and the same for, for Rinderpest. And out of this, uh, you know, one can distill these different key pieces. Um, so the, the first piece of this, uh, the piece would be feasibility, international coordination and strategy. There would also be communication uh, in this particular piece. But then the essential role of national governments, of communities, the essential role of surveillance and of research and tools. Now you may say, so this is in smallpox and rinpes, and you may say, this is old news. We know this. Of course it's old news, but are we doing this? Um, and are we doing it correctly? Um, and there are two of these things uh, that I want to highlight and, um, Surveillance is the, the first one, and I'm not ashamed that I'm, a, that I'm pushing for, for surveillance, and this vindicates it. If you look at what, so we know that rabies is severely underreported. There's very limited surveillance, and this is our own Fermi paradox. Uh, it's, it, it is a big problem in the rabies field, and, it, and it's not me that says that. If you look at what uh, what uh, uh, D. A. Henderson said, now he was the don in, in in smallpox. From the beginning, surveillance was a basic strategy of the campaign. As expected, it proved to be the ultimate quality control measure, the guide to improved operations and the yardstick of progress. So this is was a key aspect of smallpox eradication, they would mm. never have been able to do it without this piece of the, of the puzzle. If you cannot measure it, you cannot improve it. And this is where I think for working group one and working group two, where it is so critical. So working group one on surveillance um, uh, and on data and on transparency, a working group two on the stepwise approach Measuring progress, where are we? Uh, you know, what can we improve? So, so, so that whole strategy, this stepwise approach, uh, it becomes very important. So, so these are, are aspects that I would urge is important in working groups one and two. 
And then the other piece of the puzzle, which I'm sometimes concerned about, and which we need to think about, is, na uh, is national governments. So that, that piece there. Now, it is very interesting if you study smallpox and rinderpest. Smallpox was funded by national governments. It wasn't funded from outside. But if you look what D.A. Henderson says, and you can read this, and this is on multiple of his publications, things like, nor was support for the program, that smallpox eradication, generous, whatever the favorable cost-benefit ratios must or may have been. And yes, we have to make the cost to the, the case for investment. It's part of the piece. We have to say, if we invest this, we're going to save this. But what he's saying, whatever you come up with a figure there, people, you know, maybe, maybe not. Of course, it has to be part of the argument. He says it didn't mean that everybody came running with, uh, uh, with money. So uh, industrialized uh, countries were, were reluctant contributors, he said, uh, and UNICEF didn't make any contributions. Uh, cash donations to WHO during the first seven years of the smallpox problem uh, program, the first seven years, amounted to $79,000. That was the total. And he says that's not per year. That's for the total duration of the, of the, of the project. So more than 70% of the cost for smallpox eradication was carried by national governments. It wasn't outside funding. So it's just a point that I think is so important also when we, when we think about uh, our activities in, in, in working, group, uh, working Group 3 as well. So it's my plea that we should consider these things. Sometimes I feel a little bit, you know, uh, maybe, um, you know, may, maybe uh, I, people don't get my message because I think altruism and neoliberalism are enemies, they don't work together. Um, and if we want to be altruistic, we need to do that in the correct way. And that's what we want to do. So, um, so I read a piece, so I saw that we were sort of, um, so the malaria, what happens in malaria is very similar <laughs> to what happens in, in rabies. And I saw a piece by this guy, Professor Silas Majambera. Um, he's the director of scientific operations uh, at the Pan-African Mosquito Control Organization. So that's a very important organization. So it's Pan-African, so we focus a little bit on Africa, and he's a professor of medical entomology in, uh, at the university in Bamako. And so, I, so he uh, has walked the walk in the various different sectors um, in Africa, academic, but also as well as implementation um, and bringing people together, this Pan-African Mosquito Control Organization. And please bear with me. I'm going to repeat word for word some of the things that he said, because he says what I try to say much more eloquently and more directly uh, in, in many ways. So I'm, gonna, I'm going to use that. He says, uh, today, uh, the agenda for malaria elimination in Africa is largely dominated by Africans from, uh, by academics from high income countries, from international NGOs, um, industry and funding bodies. Most of them are geographically distinct from the disease and its dire consequences. Now he says to achieve malaria elimination on the continent and read rabies, Africans need to own the agenda. External partners must support the local agenda and avoid any sense of supremacy. These words. And I think it's absolutely so critical that the light bulb goes on for us. They should develop a strategy that is locally driven, long-term and embedded in a larger country development program. So this is interesting, embedded in a larger program, a larger context. And I know that's what we're trying to do, PBS, pathway, that sort of thing, that is correct. Uh, we should do that and we should do more of that. 
um, African governments need to reduce their over-reliance on external aid and increase local funding for health. So this is true for malaria, it's true for COVID, it's true for rabies. External handouts have rarely resolved a serious societal problem. Malaria is unlikely to be the exception. Rabies is unlikely to be the exception. So uh, communities, and, and from their perspective, it's all about communities. Okay, after malaria is a very huge problem, but rabies is also a big problem. So empower affected communities to participate in the fight against malaria, fight against rabies. And from his perspective, Africa is home to a growing young population. These people need to know what's going on. They should be leveraged to implement innovative community-based, and that's the key, community-based uh, interventions against, um, against the disease. Um, okay, so where do we really um, get to know the communities? So we, we are lucky to see with World Rabies Day, a lot of um, community involvement. And this, way we, this is where we know uh, from, from World Rabies Day, we know how active the communities actually are. Um, and if we look at the, uh, the events over the last three years, you can see th these are just registered events, people who, who officially register the event. So 240 in 2019, this went up to 252. Uh, in 2020 and 270 registered events in across the world. These are just those that are registered. As I say, there are many more, but these people actually go the extra step of registering them and the countries participated. So these are, um, and, and many of these people are, are repeat um, registrants. So they are, are there, they are not fly by nights. Um, they are there consistently uh, and they do their thing. And you can see on this map, this is, for example, from last year, uh, 270 events uh, from, from 58 uh, countries around the world. So uh, one of them I highlight here um, because it's kind of personal. This is from South Africa. And this young girl, Carly, uh, was, uh, as these things go, um, a, a remarkable a uh, young girl, and she died of rabies, age six. Uh, and so her aunt, um, uh, their whole family couldn't understand that. How is this possible? In a, you know, in, a, in today's day, and, uh, you, know, you know, in today's circumstances, how is it possible? And she's the aunt, so the Verna Exton, so she's the aunt of uh, um, of this girl, Carly, and she started her own movement. Now, many people do that, but what surprised me in this case is this woman's persistence. And she's not rich or anything, but her persistence. She's driving a little car. And then she comes to us, and she, so we started to give her booklets. We have some with our partners, little booklets on rabies, and then she goes to these schools. Um, and I thought, yeah, okay, this is, it was a very tragic moment in your life and, and you're going to try and do something and eventually, you know, you, you will move on. But she doesn't give up. She drives us crazy. And when I think about it, it's crazy in a good way. You know, it's always there, come to, to, come to the office. Uh, then she's organized a radio interview, we we'll go there. Uh, she wants more books, et cetera. My point is, these people, are incredibly motivated um, and they, uh, you, you know, they, they, they want to achieve. And I think uh, it's time that we give more recognition to these smaller groups. And there are many of them. And as I say, we see them uh, with World Rabies Day uh, events all, uh, all through, um, through the year. So this is then my final slide. So, so, so I think my perspective as the Secretariat for the PRP is the following. So based on what I just said to you, there are numerous 
nonprofits, charities, and individuals that make a very real difference. They make a very real difference because they believe in what they're doing in combating animal and human rabies in their communities. The second point, although they often quite small, they are also our partners. And I would argue that they are critical partners. Uh, and given the progression of the global strategic plan, and now the United Against Rabies, uh, United Against Rabies Collaboration and Forum, uh, it would be feasible to repurpose the PRP. It has achieved what it historically set out to do. So that was my original take on this. What did we want to do historically? Did we achieve? Where are we now? And I think historically that, that has been achieved. So what, the, uh, what this would then mean is that in essence, we would set out to be an alliance uh, and a home for those smaller entities. Uh, that play such a vital role in their communities. So that 270 plus, um, we would endeavor to provide better support and encouragement to them, could give them a home, make them feel part of something uh, rather than just struggling away uh, on their own, advocate for them and also to help them, uh, to align them globally um, within um, the, the UAR. Uh, where that is appropriate and, uh, and fitting. Communities uh, would be everything, I argue, in the way going forward, as also evidenced from those diseases that have been successfully eradicated. So with that, uh, I, I, I thank you very much.